Meet Kamla Devi. She's a 27-year-old Indian woman who lives in a village in Uttar Pradesh in India. She has four children, three of whom she sends to school, and her husband Udayvir is a farmer. When I first met Kamla, I visited her towards the beginning of the month. I showed up at her house at about 4 a.m., and I watched as she did all of the morning chores by the light of a kerosene lantern. First, she gathered up the cow dung, she tidied up the buffalo shed, and then after she was done with that, her children woke up, um, and we all gathered around the cooking fire as she prepared the morning chai. Her children were trying to study by the light of the cook fire, but they kept having to rub their watery eyes because of all the, the fumes from the, from the smoke. I had to actually resort to closing my eyes because the fumes were so strong. When I visited Kamla later that month, I could hear her movements, but I could see nothing. She had run out of kerosene ration for the month. She didn't have money to buy candles. And electricity had not yet come to her village. So her footsteps literally fell in cow dung as she worked. There are two billion people living in the dark like this every single day. Lighting can cost just 30% of a family's income, and almost half the population of Southeast Asia lives without electricity. So these are our customers. Our customers aspire for modernity, but they're lacking an option. So at D-Light, we provide affordable power and light solutions to underserved rural and semi-rural markets. We offer the latest in LED and solar technology. And most importantly, we design our products specifically for folks like Kamla in mind. We offer people like Kamla increased health, increased savings, access to education, and most importantly, a way to move into a brighter future. Okay, so just wanted to get the storytelling session started with an actual story. That's actually um, the first part of a pitch that I often used to give um, when I was trying to raise money for my social enterprise, for my startup, for D-Light. Um, and so I would first start with a story, um, and then I would lead into more details about the product. Um, so what I would normally ask is, okay, what do you think? Compelling, not compelling? Um, so just think about it for a moment. Now that I've told that story, just think, um, you know, did you think it was compelling? Did you think it was not compelling? Why, why not? Um, and then I'll tell you what usually most people say. So, so most, um, most people do say, oh yeah, you know, very compelling, and so I'll ask why. And here are some things that, that come up to so see if this resonated with you. Um, so number one, I tell the story of a very specific person, right? So I tell the story of Kamla. Um, and I tell you a lot about her life. So I give a lot of detail about her life, her family, you know, how she lives, things like that. And so people say that concrete picture of one specific person um, really can, you know, it just it makes it interesting. It makes it compelling sticks in their mind. Um, it's a lot of striking images that I use, so very, very little text. So these are, these are some things that come up. Um, another thing that people less often bring up, but sometimes they do notice, is that the fact that I speak in the first person. So I say things like, you know, when I first visited Kamla, um, you know, later when I visited Kamla, et cetera. Like, I'm, I'm there in the scene. I had to resort to closing my eyes because the fumes were so strong. Um, and so that is that can be very useful because I'm automatically, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm now not an expert of, of Kamala's experience, but I've been there. I know her quite well. Um, I know the details of it. I've spoken to this actual person and to this actual customer. So it gives me some, you know, some validation, some like, yeah, some credentials. She knows what she's talking about because she's been there talking to folks that have this problem. Um, so speaking from your own experiences in the first person can be very, very compelling. Um, so since this is a webinar, you didn't see these things, but usually when I do this in person, I'll, I also have a few props. So for example, um, towards the beginning of the story, when I'm talking about the kerosene lantern, I actually have a kerosene lantern lit. Um, in the middle of the story, when she runs out of kerosene ration, you know, I, I, I take a moment to pause, I blow out the, the the flame from the kerosene lantern, 
Um, and then actually on this slide that I've left it on, I pull out the D-Light product and actually light it up. And so um, people can actually see what it is that my product is. Um, and so just a few props, again, not going too over the top, too theatrical, but a few props um, also can be can make a story quite compelling. So um, to be very fair, some people say, well, I don't know, not very compelling for me. And so here are a couple things that um, I've heard in the past. Number one, it sounds rehearsed. Yeah, it's pretty rehearsed. You know, I've done this pitch. I've made this pitch probably literally hundreds of times. Um, and so it does get hard to, you know, when, when you've repeated it so many times to sound really genuine. And so that's something that if I were actually going to be pitching, I would work really hard on making sure that it sounds natural and not rehearsed. Um, so delivery, right, in practice is really key. Um, and then, of course, another complaint that I often get is, well, you didn't give us enough about the solution. You know, what exactly is your product? Um, and so what I usually respond is, well, you know, of course, this is not this is not my whole pitch. I wouldn't then just sit down and think, okay, I'm done. Um, but it is hopefully enough to give the audience a really quick background as to what exactly we're dealing with here, what specific, what specific problem I want to solve. And now, here, let me show you some um, slides about how I'm going to solve this problem. And so then later I get into details about the product, um, details about you know, our financials, who's going to pay for this, how much does it cost, things like that. Um, but just starting with the hook to get them interested, using a story in that way can be quite, can be quite compelling. Um, so Reid already talked a lot about your, your project pitch um, and the logistics around it, so I'm not going to repeat any of that. Um, but during this webinar, we are going to be focused on, focusing on how you might use storytelling elements um, in your own pitch. Okay, so I'm not going to, I'm not really going to give you a formula about, you know, here's how exactly how you do it. Um, everybody's pitch will probably still look very different, but just be thinking about how can I apply some of these things to my own, you know, five to ten minute um, pitch um, next month. So again, we talked about this, the meat of the pitch, what they're really looking for, um, and questions that they're likely to ask. I'll point out a couple places during my webinar where I think, ooh, this method could really help with answering you know, this specific piece um, about what they're looking for. So I'll try to remember to point those things out along the way. Um, OK, so we'll talk about what makes a good story. Um, and then I'll also talk about sort of you know, give you a process for how to come up with your own um, stories and your own pitches. Um, so I will give you kind of a process to follow. Um, and these slides will be available if they're not already. Um, so don't, don't worry about that. Um, so why storytelling? Storytelling has literally been used for um, probably hundreds, maybe if not thousands of years. Right? That is the way in which um, people communicate. And what's great about storytelling is that we are all natural born storytellers. We all know how to tell a story. Um, we all tell stories you know, with our friends, their family, in our daily, in our daily lives. Um, and stories can be very sticky. So we remember information best when it's told in the form of a story. Um, so if you told me something, if you actually told me the story about it, I'll remember it better than if you just told me the facts, right? Um, and then also, stories can convey a lot of information in very, very little amount of time. Um, so thinking back to my Kamala story, I could have given a lot of statistics um, about lighting and about what families use it for and things like that, but with maybe a one minute to two minute story, I'm able to get across a lot of those details in a really short and sticky um, amount of time. So um, a story at its core is, 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 is pretty simple. Um, so I'm going to show you, this is the basic story arc. This is a graph of the basic story arc. Um, and before you even actually look at the graph, something to consider is that a story is a character-driven dramatic narrative. Um, so Reed alluded to it earlier when he was starting to talk about personas. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that and how to more detail about how to create a good persona. But you want to think character. You know, your stories have to have some sort of specific character. 
Um, and then once you have that character, then they go through these three parts, right? So over time, as tension builds, um, you have some action first. Um, and then at the height of the tension, there's probably some sort of conflict. Um, and then as the conflict resolves, um, you know, there's, there's a resolution. There's something that happens that resolves that conflict. Um, so oftentimes, stories, um, you know, might, be t might not be told in that order, or there might be multiple conflicts and multiple resolutions. But if you think about any good stories you've heard, you'll be able to kind of pick out those three main parts. So we sort of also map this to, you know, to pitches and to advocating for a new idea or for a new solution. So you can map it in this way. So in the beginning part, you want to show your user or your stakeholder, right, and you know who they are, what their life is like, maybe a little bit of action at the beginning, um, and then as the tension rises, the conflict potentially is the problem that they're having or the opportunity that you see in their life to improve it in some way, right? And then the resolution is your solution um, and whatever impact your solution is going to have on that person and then even on the world more broadly or on the ecosystem more broadly, okay? So again, to give you an example, with the Kamla Devi story, um, of course, my, my user, my stakeholder in the beginning is Kamla. And so the action that we saw was how what her morning looks like um, on a normal morning with kerosene, right? So she's gathering up the cow dung, tidying up the buffalo shed, et cetera. Um, the conflict actually occurs when I visit her later and she has no more kerosene. She doesn't have money to buy candles. She doesn't have electricity, right? So that's kind of the moment of conflict. Now she has no other option but to do her chores in the dark. Um, and then I present the solution or the resolution, which is, you know, this D-Light product. It's the solar-powered LED light, specifically designed for Kamla, will help her in this way. Um, so that would be how I would map out that, you know, that basic story arc for, for, my, for my pitch. Um, so one thing that we'll be spending some time on today, and you might want to just start thinking about, you know, who is the Kamala Devi in your own story? Um, what specific person, what specific, what specific character, probably someone that you've interviewed um, in the past few weeks, who is going to sort of represent, um, who's the archetype for, for what you're trying to do, for what problem you're trying to solve? Um, so I'll just pause there. It doesn't look like there are any questions yet. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going, but don't be shy with questions, definitely. Um, so this is the process that I'm going to talk you through today. Um, so five steps here, um, and we'll go through each one. Uh, as identifying your character, so um, you know I'll talk about how to create a persona, then how to prototype your story, and again it goes back to that building that basic story arc, um, and then once you have those two things, then you can start adding some personality. Um, you know, how are you going to bring it to life? Uh, and then designing a hook, how are you going to really begin it and, and draw people in? And then towards the very end, there's this thing that we call crafting your story, which has to do with, um, with, with um, you know, creating slides and um, practicing your delivery, knowing where your pauses are going to be, things like that. Um, so just a really, really big important thing to note is don't worry about PowerPoint or creating slides until the very end, until you're crafting your story. Up until that point, um, it's often useful to just work in a medium that's a lot easier to change on the fly. So I often like to just prototype things with post-its. Um, so just something to consider when you're working with your team on this. Okay, so first we're going to figure out, you know, how are we going to identify or how are we going to create this, this persona? So we're identifying that one main character that our story is going to be about. Um, so again, you just you just choose one person, and it, again, it's probably your an end user, someone um, that is directly affected or is using this, you know, or, or having this problem that you think you want to solve. Um, probably someone that you've interviewed, and be specific. Give them a name. Um, so a lot of people say, oh well. 
I have a lot of people in mind. Well, you could, if you wanted, make sort of a composite of multiple people, um, but try to make them really interesting, really specific. The more unique they are, I think the more interesting your story will be. So don't try to, you know, if you, if you slew a bunch of people together and it's kind of like, oh, it's just an everyday person, maybe not that interesting of a story. But think of, you know, why is this person unique? Why do I want to tell this person a story? Um, so definitely give them a name. If you don't want to use their actual name, that's fine. Give them a, a fake name. Um, and then one really key thing that people often forget is show us who that person is, right? So make sure you have an image of them. Um, hopefully you were taking, I, I, I'm not sure that this was mentioned, but hopefully you were trying to take some photos as you were doing your interviews in the past few weeks. If not, don't worry about it. But just know that in the future, it can be really, really helpful um, to have some nice photos of either the person that you're interviewing or maybe their environment, so their office, where they work, whatever, um, to, to help you to communicate your story when you're presenting it to other people. Um, if you don't have a photo of them, it's totally fine. You can do a quick sketch, perhaps, um, or find one that's within, you know, that's tasteful um, on the internet. Um, but that's really key. Make sure you actually have a specific visual for them. You want to literally show us who they are. Um, and then you want to just write a profile for that person. So give them some um, bullet points of information to make them come alive. Um, so things like how old they are. Um, and don't worry about just sticking to, you know, their life at work, maybe even giving us a bigger picture of who they are and what they care about and what they believe. Um, juicy quotes, I don't have any here, but juicy quotes can be really, really useful to have, um, you know, in your, in your persona or in your profile. Um, and then, of course, don't forget to add a few bullet points or detail about how specifically does the problem that you want to solve, how does it show up or manifest itself in this person's life, you know, give a really concrete example. So I gave the concrete example of, well, you know, she runs out of kerosene and then she's, you know, walking in cow dung as she does the morning chores because she can't see anything. She doesn't have any other lighting options. So she, um, I think that's probably one of, one of the toughest things about creating this persona is being really specific. You could even give a specific instance of where this problem um, you know, showed up in this person's life, right? And say, and you know, and that happens all the time, or you know, that sort of thing. Um, so again, if you if you don't have one specific person in mind, it's okay to create a composite, but just remember to be very detailed. Okay, so so we have you have your character, or you're hopefully you're thinking about <laughs> who your character might be. Um, you've given them a little bit of a, of a background, a personality, um, a little bit of a, a scenario. Um, and so now you can start to prototype what your story might be. So I want to actually introduce to you two different story arcs. Um, and this sort of, um, this is because of, of what the pitch is asking you for. So I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but in order to think about which story arcs you want to use and when, um, we should also, it's really important to think about audience. Um, so for your story or your pitch, think about who is your audience. Um, and so I think Reed told you that there's, there's going to be three panel members um, that are going to be listening to the pitches. And really think about, you know, what do they care about? Um, what is their environment or mood? So for example, um, they will probably have just listened to 10 other, you know, uh, five to 10 minute pitches. So what, you know, really think about that. They're going to be, they might be tired. They might be, um, you know, overwhelmed, things like that. And so how are you then going to kind of get their attention and draw them in? So really think about these folks that you're, you're pitching to. Um, what do you want them to take away um, is really key. And um, in other words, you know, a, a great example that I always use with my students here is when they're, they're, they're probably going to only remember like two or three key things about your presentation without looking at their notes. 
Um, and so what's the thing that they're going to go home that night and tell their partner over dinner about your presentation, right? So what are those one or two or three, maybe three maximum key things you want to get across? So for these first three questions, what's their mood? What do they care about? Um, what do you want them to take away? Those are all given to you um, by Reed in that email that he sent um, a few days ago. So really dig into that. Um, he's giving you some great clues as to what, you know, what your story should be about. Um, and that, I think, is going to help you decide you know, which story arcs to include um, and when. So the last thing, of course, that a good pitch always has is some sort of call to action, right? So what do you want your audience to do? Um, and so in this case, you know, it's pretty obvious. Yeah, you want, you probably want to um, a spot in the Ignite Accelerator. Um, but maybe go beyond that, you know, because what is it that you want to do next? What is it that you need to get answered? Or you need a little time, or you need a little more help or something. Um, you know, if you were to get into the accelerator, what are the, what are the activities you're going to be doing to move this project along? Um, so think about maybe, you know, how you can include that in your story as well. So back to these two story arcs. Um, we'll start with this first, with the user-centered story arc. So it looks like this. Um, and again, um, I, we have a, a, a PDF of just this slide that you could print out um, and literally with your team, you know, map out on four post-its um, a really basic story arc. Um, and so that's how I imagine this template being used. So, and I'll, I'll show you that through an example. So first of all, of course, your user, who are they? What do they want? Right, give us some character action. So our user is, you know, Kamla Devi or whatever it is, refer back to your persona. Um, and then what's that conflict? What's that need? So our user needs blank, or this is missing from their life. Um, your solution, so we will provide. Um, and the thing I want to point out here is I know probably most of you um, don't have a, oh, and definitely this is the solution quite yet, right? So you're probably not quite there yet, but you might have a hunch as to what might be the solution or multiple hunches. We think it could be this, this, or this. So, you know, you might say that. We, we think that this might be a great, you know, answer to their problem, um, which is what we want to test in, during the United Accelerator, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the resolution, you know, what, what impact is this going to have? And I think the really key thing here is you've got to end your story by bringing the character back into it, right? So what impact is your solution going to have on Kamla Devi or on that specific person? Um, but also, more broadly, right, on, like I said before, on the greater ecosystem, um, what impact is this going to have? And so I did that, I think, towards the beginning in my story. I talked about, you know, there are, uh, it's really 1.2 billion people out there just like Kamla living like this every day. So that kind of um, points out, you know, this, this, could, this could be a product that affects the world much more broadly. Um, so how are you going to talk about impact? So this is the user-centered story arc. Um, and then the second story arc that you might consider um, is the what we learned story arc. And so I just want to say that this is probably not an either or thing. Um, you can include both. You can mix them up. You can have multiple what we learn story arcs. Um, so I'll talk about that more in a, in a moment. But don't, don't feel like, oh my gosh, I have to pick one. You might use both and incorporate them in, both in your pitch in some way. Okay, so the what we learn story arc. Um, this is great for um, highlighting perhaps something, something that you learned, something um, that was a really big key discovery. Maybe it was, an, it was a key pivot. Um, but it'll, it'll become a little more clear once I, once I walk through it. So the first piece is, again, you're starting off low on that tension, right? So it's that original assumption. Well, you know, we were, we were just working as, our te as a team, and our original hypothesis was X. You know, we thought that maybe it's something like this. We thought that um, the problem was this. Um, and so then 
what conflict happens? What's the experiment you do? So then we went out and we started talking to a bunch of people and actually what they were saying was X, Y, Z, right? So, so we tried you know, talking to a lot of people about this problem, validating this problem, and what we found was actually this, right? So, oh my goodness, we thought it was this, but it's actually might be something else. Okay, so now bring us home with the, re with the resolution. So talk about that aha moment. Well, what was it that you learned? Well, we learned that actually this is the problem instead. Um, and so the resolution is how your project path is going to change. So now, based on what we learned, we're actually going to go in this direction instead, and we're going to start talking to these people and investigating this as a problem or whatever it is. Um, so again, I'm 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 sure that they probably um, last month Dean and Edmund probably talked about um, you know pivots or just you know validating or invalidating some. Um, value propositions that your customer segments might have. And so this is a great story arc to show, you know, some of those big discoveries that you've made so far in your customer discovery process. Um, so again, just to point out, you know, this is exactly what Reed is asking for. Who did you interview and why? What did you learn? Um, but telling it in the form of a story is going to be much more compelling, much more interesting, um, and much more memorable than just listing the folks that you talk to and the things that you learn. So give us a specific anecdote, anecdote perhaps, of, about you know, who you talk to, what that moment was like for you. OK, so I'm going to pause there. Reed, do we have any questions? Oh, sorry. I had <laughs> Uh, I was muted. So let me jump in with one question that was posted by Jim here. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, he, he asked, in your story that you presented, did you get official written consent from the family to use their images, names, uh, or was it a fictionalized story? Okay. Um, so did I? Did I? I did not get like I did not get Kamala Devi's signature as to yes, you know, you can use my story and publish it, um, but. She was well aware <laughs> that you know that I was um, you know that I was starting this company, and in fact, um, it was actually kind of a cool story. Later, she even um, became an entrepreneur for for us and uh, was selling light to her village, which was pretty exciting. Um, but no, I think that if you were doing um, like actually trying to publish research or things like that, then perhaps you would need to go and, and get permission. Um, Definitely, if, if it's a situation that's very sensitive, um, we want to you know, be aware of, of those sorts of privacy issues and obviously respect the, the person's you know, wishes if they don't want you know, their picture shown or their actual name shown. Um, but the core of the story can still be true, but you could use other names or you could use other images. Um, you know, this is a pitch that we would do to Investors private yeah. setting, so it was never really an issue for us. Uh, a related question: It often comes up. You know, should we use we be using real names like Kamla Devi or, um, you know, and the persona that that I had up in the slides is like um, Sally Salesman, Sally Saleswoman, you know, something like that. Do, do you have? Does that matter too much? Um, you know, some people have sort of opinions on. I don't know that I've heard that in the past. So I don't know what you think. Yeah, I don't know. It hasn't. It hasn't really been an issue um, for me. Um, I like using the real names when I can, um, or trying to maybe just use first names. I used to do a lot of work um, out in the San Francisco Bay Area with um, nonprofits and foundations, and. Um, for example, uh, I used to do a lot of work with a, a, a place that was giving shelter to people experiencing homelessness. Um, and the, in that situation, it was always okay just to use their first name, and so that's what I did. Um, and I often I would ask them, hey, you know, do you mind if I tell your story, but just use your first name? And they were like, yeah, that's fine. So I think just your judgment, you know, obviously, like if you think it's going to be a sensitive situation, then ask them. Um, use your judgment. In the end, we're trying to, I think we're trying to help folks. So. Yeah, sort of the, um, 
it, it's certainly a touchy sort of as you know being within government and um, uh, it's not that big of a deal I think from our perspective to change a name or make up something um, uh, for sure so uh, okay. yeah I think I think your guidance is right if there's anything we're just avoid it and, and make up a name Right. The, the one thing that I would be really careful about, and I often have to talk to our students about this, is if you do make up a name, you know, don't don't be too silly with it. I mean, you can have some fun with it, but don't be too silly with it. Um, do be respectful to that person. Um, sometimes we have, um, you know, students that will, they're just, it's all in good fun, but again, just be respectful. So a, a related question, and I'm going to bring in uh, John's question, who asked, did you actually visit her in India, right? So sometimes one has like pretty deep interactions with a customer so they can tell a real story, and then sometimes you're making up a story. Can you describe, you know, to characterize at a, maybe a particular example, can you describe, you know, sort of that back and forth and what that ends up feeling like and looks like? I wouldn't advise... I wouldn't advise on making up a story. Um, that, that my anecdote about Kamla, yes, I spent a lot of time with her, and so and and I show that off. I say, you know, when I first visited Kamla, um, because I wanted to show my potential investors that look, you know, I have like I'm spending a lot of time in country, in the market that I'm trying to serve. And that's what sets me apart from all of those other people out there trying to also serve the same customer segment. They're trying to do it from far away. No, like I'm, <laughs> I'm there with Kamala. I'm spending a lot of time with her. Um, and so I think that's, and, and, and you, you, all of you are doing the exact same thing through the customer discovery process by going out and doing those interviews. Um, you're spending a lot of good quality time, hopefully, and I mean quality time like I used to, I would shadow, I would like be her shadow for days, not just sit down for like a 60 minute, 90 minute interview, but I got to know her family quite well because I would, I was at her, um, I was at her house for, you know, a long, long period of time and hopefully you can get, um, that level with 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 your customers. I think that's how you really know, you know, what it is that they're really struggling with. Um, so definitely would not make up a story. Um, my so for my specific story, um, it just worked out well that yeah, I had actually seen her struggle with this, and I had felt the effects of no kerosene myself. Um, it could be a story that you hear from one of your customers, right? So it could be. Um, something, a story that they've told you about a specific instance of the problem that they have. And that's fine if you weren't present for, you know, the time that their database um, wasn't working or whatever it was. Um, but these should be true stories, I would say. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah, interesting. Um, so, so one thing that's probably uh, to your disadvantage, uh, uh, we're encouraging during the discovery phase to just focus on the interviews and we haven't uh, quite introduced to push people to do like in-person observations sort of shadowing and things like that. Um, those things we would probably get to I think in the accelerator itself. So it sounds like uh, the principles are the same. Um, yeah. you know, getting to know people through the conversations um, and, and trying to glean stories from them would be, uh, could be pretty useful as well. Right, so your your best interviews are the ones where you've actually gotten them to tell you a story about a specific instance. Yeah. Um, if, you're, if your interviews are like, oh, what do you usually do, or what generally is the problem with the workflow process, um, try to go back to them and say, no, tell me, tell me about a time where this is a big problem for you. Get really specific. The best interviews are the ones where you're getting um, you're getting little anecdotes. You're getting stories from people. Yeah, so, so Lewis posted a question uh, building on this, and you had this really neat transition in your presentation where you go from Kamla sort of out to the world. Um, yeah. uh, that sounds like a pretty neat technique um, that, that maybe you could highlight a little bit. Uh, are there any other, so like how does that play into 
the sewing the whole story. So again, that goes back to the impact, right? And so on the very last, um, let me try to go back here. On the very last piece of the user-centered story arc, um, it's it's about the outcome and the impact. What is the outcome, or and or what is the impact? So. Um, I, I did that in a little bit of a sneaky way. I brought it up out of order, right? So first I introduced Kamala, then I introduced this problem that she has and this conflict that she has, and then I say there are a lot of people out there, you know, there are 1.2 billion people out there like, you know, out in the world like, like Kamala. Um, and so I don't explicitly say in the end, and therefore we are, you know, we're going to, um, provide a lighting option for these 1.2 billion people. Um, but I think that's sort of alluded to. So you can see that, you know, in the end, you might be mapping out this basic story arc on four post-its, um, but you can be a little bit, um, not sneaky, but um, I guess graceful about how you, how you include some of those details. So it may not be in that exact linear order. I do, though, in the end of my story, start to list out some of the, the outcomes or the impact. So things like, access to education, improved health, increased savings. I kind of just list those out. Um, and then later in my full pitch, um, we, have some, we had some data as to some estimates to, to give some number, concrete numbers to those things because some of our potential investors were interested in that. Um, but any way that you can kind of show impact, and again, it's really important, don't forget about the impact on this character that you've just set up for us. I often see that in pitches. I'll see a team start really, really strong with like a great um, you know, story about a specific person, and then they'll get into the need, and then they'll show their, show their solution, and then they'll start talking very generally about the impact and not like go back and end that story. Here is Kamala using our light, um, which is exactly that last image that I showed you, right? It's, it's her you know, using our light um, as she cooks the morning chai. Um, so, yeah, so I think you can, there's some interesting ways to kind of to draw in, again, impact of, on the person and then on the world more broadly. Yeah, that's great. So we've got a number of questions that are, are still in the queue, but why don't we turn it back over to you Okay. Uh, and let you keep going. Awesome. Okay. Okay, so we have our, we have our character, we have our persona, um, we've, talked about some story arcs, and again, I think the really key thing about the different story arcs, both human-centered story arc and the what we learn story arc, is you might have to mix and match, right? You might have both. Um, you might have one user-centered story arc to sort of start your pitch, and then you might have a few what we learn story arcs, if there's like two or three key pivots that you made so far in your process. Um, it's really up to you and your team and how you want to, um, what you want to communicate um, to, to the panel. So this third piece is about, now that you have that basic story arc, you want to add some personality right to your story. Um, and so we talk about what are those show, don't tell elements um, that you're going to use to make your story really come alive. So um, I think there are, there are a ton of different techniques you can use to really make your story come alive. Um, I'm going to try to talk through five of them um, to show some examples. I thought my ethics has already responded, like, my mom was like, does that, like, you're like. So, hey, Reed. Because I think I do it already. My I'm hearing some background noise. Yeah, I am too. Okay. Uh, my end. Uh, but on my end, better. Nature joins, right? Yeah, so if you scroll all the way down. You'll, you'll Somebody's scrolling all the way down. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, hello, everybody. If you um, uh, happen to have, for some reason, your phone uh, in front of you, just go ahead and hit the mute button, um, and then, Erica, I'll go through the admin panel and try okay. to see if somebody's actually on mute as well. Sorry about that. Well, no worries. Uh, at first, I thought somebody was asking a question, but no. Okay. Okay, so let's start um, with the first show, don't tell element. And so I'm going to show this actually through an example. So I'm going to read um, two different beginnings. I'm going to read two different beginnings to this story. 
Um, and I want you to just think about which one is more compelling, which one draws you in more, okay? So here's the first one. So I was thinking about climbing this mountain. But then I watched a little TV and made a snack and took a nap. And my mom called and vented. And then I did a little laundry, a white load. I lost another stock today. And then I thought about it again and decided I'd climb the mountain the next day. Okay, so that's the beginner from story one. Um, and then here's another first line to the story. The mountain loomed before me. Right, me I had my knife, some trail, some trail mix, and snow boots. I had to make it to the little cabin and start a fire before sundown or freeze to death for sure. Right, so that, that one's on my... Um, so just think, more, so think about which is more compelling and why. This one had it. Let me see. So most people tend to say that the second one is more compelling. Um, some people like the first one because it is a little bit more playful and funny. Um, but a lot of folks say that the second one is more compelling. Um, and the reason for that is because it starts in the middle of the action, right? It takes us right to that conflict. It doesn't waste time setting up characters and things like that. Um, and so that is a great tactic to use to just start in the middle of the action. Um, and then maybe later give us more about you know, who that person is. Um, and so again, that gets to, you don't have to you know, tell your, you know, once you've created your, your story arc with Post-its, you don't feel like you have to go in that yeah, order. Be able to come over. Kind, of, kind of play with the order a little bit, start in the action, if that's, if that's helpful and compelling. Uh, I have to meet from, but section 5.0, so you just so, have to Next, um, show, don't tell element is to connect with your audience. Um, so I'm not going to play this TED talk, but I highly recommend if you have never seen um, Jill uh, Bolte Taylor's Stroke of Insight TED talk, um, definitely check it out. Um, and there's there's some really interesting things that she does to really connect with her audience. So. Um, Dr. Taylor actually studies the brain. Um, she's an expert on the human brain. Um, and her TED Talk is about um, a stroke that she had where she was able to, she had enough cognitive ability to still be able to understand what was going on to her body, even though she didn't have physical ability, which is really fascinating. Um, but in order to set up her story, she has to tell us a little bit about how the brain works. And so, I don't have a I'm, a, I'm an engineer, I don't have a hard science background and, or a biology background, um, but she does such a great job of simplifying how the brain works for her audience. So not talking above us, um, still using, you know, scientific terminology, um, but just presenting the information in a way that's really easy to understand. And so I was listening to her talk and I, and I picked out a few key things that she does. Um, that might be interesting for you to consider with your own talk, especially if um, the topic that you're dealing with is maybe very scientific or just very complex given where you are, um, you know, in, in the department. Um, there might be a lot of background knowledge that you think, oh, the person has to have in order to understand the problem they're working on. That's fine, but think about a really simple way to explain these things. So analogies can be really useful. Um, what Dr. Taylor does is she actually uses the analogy of um, a computer. So she says, you know, there's one side of the brain that works like a parallel processor and one third side of the brain that works like a serial processor. Um, and so folks that understand computers are immediately able to understand, oh, okay, I know what that means. Um, she also uses visuals. So the image here, um, she brings an actual um, human brain. Um, to show, and so that's just kind of fun and interesting, and she's using it to show, you know, the different parts of the brain. So think about how might you use visuals to, to bring your story to life, or your really complex problem to life. She also personifies the brain. So at one point she says, um, you know, each hemisphere does different things, cares about different things, and has different personalities. Um, and then she even talks about how the left hemisphere cares about X, Y, Z. Um, and so just kind of personifying this, um, you know, human organ, um, I think was 
caught me a little bit off guard, was kind of fun and really just kept me engaged and involved in understanding, you know, trying to understand really how the brain functions and operates. Um, a couple of other things, she actually includes the audience. So I'll give you an example. Um, she's trying to explain, you know, how the left side of the brain, how, what it makes us aware of, so like what the function is of it. And she says, I am an energy being. We are energy beings connected to one another. When the left hemisphere tells me that I am separate, I am me, and I'm a separate being from all of you. So again, she's, she's bringing the audience into this story about how the brain works and functions. So including your audience um, in this explanation of a really complex problem can be really helpful. Um, and last of all, simple examples. So, you know, for example, the left brain is that little voice that says to me, um, hey, you need to pick up bananas on your way home, right? So it's, again, it's a really simple example, um, but makes it really easy and concrete for me to understand what types of things the left brain, um, the left side of the brain might, might do and how it might function. Um, so think about those things. How are you going to really connect with your audience um, as you're explaining a really complex, perhaps, problem or topic? Okay. So we've talked about starting in the action. We've talked about connecting with the audience. Um, this next one, or actually these next two, I'm going to actually I'm going to illustrate with an example. So this next example is one of a put me in the room anecdote but it's also an example of how you might include a moment of reflection um, in, your, in your pitch. Prototypes in hand, we went from house to house getting the Indian villagers' feedback. I was nervous. We had just spent six months getting to these final prototypes, but I was excited to see how people would react. In the first house we visited, one man took the light from my hands and hung it from a hook on the ceiling. The colors of the room really came alive with our light. We then visited a vendor's cart. And again, the vendor immediately took the light and rigged it up to the side of his cart. The next day, however, we went to a more rural village consisting mainly of farmers. One of the farmers that I met showed me around his farm. It turns out that it's located a couple miles away from his house. So he built a mud hut to use when he's out on the farm. So once the vegetables start to grow, um, he must guard the, the harvest at night so that animals don't eat them. So he took our light, turned it over in his hands, and signaled to me, the light must have a handle on top. He wants to use this light to walk around his field at night, not just hang it from the ceiling. Um, so why not just put a handle on top for him? Farmer after farmer that I talked to that day all said the same thing. Now, this was a really important moment for me and my team. The other engineers were already in China getting tooling made, so changing anything now would really slow us down and frustrate our manufacturer. But I knew that being human-centered was a big part of our company's identity. So I called the team in China, and we went to work on figuring out how to add a handle. Okay. So two things there. Again, it's this, it's this specific anecdote, right? So I could have just said, oh, our light has a handle on top because this is how people want to use it. But this is actually a nice example of a little what we learned story arc, right? We thought the handle could be just on the side. We went out, we started showing it to people, and some people liked that, but this one guy said, no, it needs to be on the top because here's why. Um, and so therefore, you know, we didn't know what to do. We had this conflict, it's gonna slow us down. Um, but then the resolution as well, we decided this is really important for us. And so we want to be human-centered. We want to listen to our customers. And so we're changing our direction and going this way instead. Um, so it's also a nice example of the what we learned story arc. Um, and the moment of reflection actually comes when I say, but this is a really important moment for me and my team. So don't be afraid to say things like that. <laughs> Um, especially if your pitch is running towards like the 10 minute side, you're going to want to clue people in to when they should really listen to you, when they should really be paying attention. You're about, I'm about to say something important, so listen up here. It's okay to say these things 
and give your audience some, some clues or some hints as to what, you know, when the punchline is coming, so when they should wake up. Um, so consider including both of those elements to help your story really come alive. And then the last thing um, that I'm going to talk about, there, again, there's so many other things, the last thing that I'll talk about in terms of show, don't tell elements are including artifacts. Um, so you might not have you know, photos of, uh, or sketches of your products, but maybe sketches of whiteboards that you've um, you know, done with your team. Or um, you know, maybe you've started to take some of that interview data and find some patterns, and you have some post-its in your office you know, that you are starting to put together all of the different facts or something. Take pictures of that. Show, show off your work. Um, Maybe it's a video to illustrate the problem. So we often used to play um, this video of a battery being recycled during our pitch, you know, to show what a, what a dangerous process it is. It's folks that are touching battery acid and lead plates with their bare hands in order to recycle these batteries. Um, and so think about other artifacts, other things that you might use um, in your, in your, during your pitch to really show and not tell you know, each piece of your story. Um, key thing here, if you're using video, definitely rehearse. Um, even if you rehearse, it probably won't go well, but sometimes they can be uh, quite powerful. Okay, any questions there? I know that that was a big section of info. We just have two more, two more steps in the process. Um, I'll keep going, I'm not seeing anything. Um, okay, so after you, you, know, you have some personality that you're adding to your story, um, how do you get folks to listen in the first place? Um, so you want to really think about how your, how your pitch is going to begin. You know, hopefully you're not starting with, hi, we're such and such team. I know um, Reed is asking you for a, a slide with a list of your team members. You don't necessarily have to start with that, right? Maybe you hook the audience in first. Um, it depends on what you know what works for your team and for your pitch. Um, and so, uh, TED talks are notorious for having sort of a formula, um, but they have some interesting first lines. And so, what a colleague of mine did was he um, he strung together four sort of openers to four different TED talks. And so, I want you to just listen to these these starts to their stories and just see which you think is most um, most enticing, the one that you really want to go home and like finish watching the rest of the talk. So I'm going to try to play this video. Um, Reed, will you let me know if the sound is not, if the volume is not high enough? Yeah, sure. Please close your eyes and open your hands. Sounds good. Now imagine what you could place in your hands. An apple, maybe your wallet. Now open your eyes. What about a life? It's the Second World War, a German prison camp, and this man, Archie Cochran, is a prisoner of war and a doctor, and he has a problem. We need to make a confession at the outset here. Uh, a little over 20 years ago, uh, I did something that I regret, something that I'm not particularly proud of, something that in many ways I wish no one would ever know, but that here I feel kind of obliged to reveal. Uh, so I decided instead um, I would talk about someone who I think has done as much to make Americans happy um, as perhaps anyone over the last uh, 20 years, a man who is a great personal hero of mine, um, someone by the name of Howard Moskowitz, who is most famous for reinventing spaghetti sauce. Okay. So just take a moment and Think about you know which one you found most enticing. Um, so, in in previous times where I've presented this, most people really like the Daniel Tink 
story, and so they want to hear his confession. Um, others also really like the first hook by um, the one by Jane Chen, where she's saying, for you to close your eyes, hold out your hand. Um, and, but the thing that we always talk about with that first hook is it, that one takes a lot of practice. You know, it could have come off as, um, you know, sort of hokey or cheesy, but her, the delivery that she has is great, right? She, the tone that she has, um, you know, very, she's very grave, um, she pauses, um, and so it's that practice of, of the delivery of that hook that I think works really, really well. Um, so think about, again, you know, there's probably 10 presentations before yours, um, so how are you going to really get the audience's attention and make yours memorable, make yours stand out, and get them to really listen to you? Um, so think, take some time to think about that hook. And I often say, we'll do it after you've sort of created your basic story arc and laid out your presentation and thought about personality, um, because it might not come to you until after you've, you've written the story. Um, I have all the images in here, just in case I have to read them. Okay. So designing a hook. And then finally, it's finally time to craft your story. Um, so this is a good moment where you might start to work with, um, with PowerPoint or a keynote or whatever, um, you know, whatever you might use to, to create your, your slide deck and to gather all your visuals. Um, so a couple things to think about here. These are all visuals that are really supporting your story. So it's not, it's not telling your story. Um, it's just supporting your story. So we don't, we probably don't want to see a bunch of slides that look like this, right? So like really tiny graphs. Um, oh, well, and first of all, a graph that's not labeled, a really tiny graph, and like a ton of text. Um, it's more about show us that striking image you are the storyteller, right? So you tell us what it is that we need to know or what, is, what it is we need to hear. Um, so try to keep the, you know, the text and things like that on the slides to, to a minimum. Um, and as my former colleague Nicole Kahn says, capitalize on compelling visuals to really tell your story. Um, and secondly, another really key part of crafting that not enough people spend time on is practicing that delivery. Um, so for any of you that are interested in um, just being exposed, maybe being inspired by um, professional storytellers, definitely check out, if you have not checked out before, the moth.org. Um, and so you can actually see videos of storytellers on stage telling these stories. They have no props. They have no slides. It's just literally them in the microphone. And they're probably about 15 to 20 minute stories. Um, and but but they they don't lose your interest. They're so engaging, and I think it's I think it's things like their hand gestures, they pause, they do funny voices, they speed up, they slow down. You know, they're putting themselves into it, and it's about the delivery of the story. Um, so in that same way, you know, practice your pitch. Hopefully, you have the slides done a week before, and you practice for your team, and you practice for your family, and you practice for other. Um, coworkers or people that have never even heard anything about your project just to see how they react to it. Um, so don't forget to build in um, time for, for that. We'll be able to really tell, you know, who's, who's rehearsed and who hasn't. Um, so just to, to wrap up or just to sort of summarize what we've gone over so far, um, you might think about, you know, how are you going to use storytelling to communicate your project or to advocate for your project? Um, you know, to get a space in the, in the accelerator. Um, keep in mind that stories are character driven. So think about who is your Kamla Devi, who's the person that you're going to talk about um, in your pitch. Um, stories have three parts, the action, conflict, and resolution. And so make sure that you're presenting your story arcs in a way where those are all evidence, those are all present. Um, and a process, so here's a, you know, a process to follow. Um, as you create your story, first think about your character. So build that persona with your team. Be specific. Have fun with it. Be specific. Um, then you can think about your story arcs. So are we going to use both story arcs, the, the what we learned and the, the user-centered one? Are we going to just use one of them? Maybe we're going to have multiple, things like that. So put a basic structure down using only post-its. 
Um, and then you can start to add some personality. So we talked about a bunch of different elements today. Um, and then last of all, don't forget to think about you know, how you're going to begin your story, what's that opening line that's going to grab people's attention. Um, and then, of course, leave time, hopefully at least a week, to craft it. So to think about those, the supporting visuals um, and also the delivery. Um, so questions, comments? I'm happy to answer any questions. Erica, that was that was excellent. Uh, thank you so much for, for your time. It was um, yeah. really, really well organized. <clears throat> um, I, I guess the first question I pull up, and we, we've just got a couple in here, um, is posted by Lewis. Um, uh, he says he's more familiar with the, quote, bottom line up front. Oh, sorry, bottom line up front. <laughs> Uh, pitch style, I, so I may be talking about what we learned first and explain what happened, which is slightly opposite, it sounds like, to the storytelling. Uh, for the pitch, would you recommend sticking with the storytelling style? Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with that phrase, bottom line up front, uh, so I don't know if that means it resonates with you at all, Erica. I, I would I mean I've heard pitches where it's like we are we are X company and we're going to change the world in this way. Here, let me tell you how. Um, I'm thinking about like maybe that sort of um, pitch that I've I've heard in the past. Um, I think that's fine. I think you can still incorporate storytelling elements. You know, when you go back to now, let me tell you how we got here or how we're going to do this. I think you can still use storytelling elements um, throughout. You know, throughout a bottom line uh, pitch. Yeah, yeah. I think at the highest level, and this is what you started your whole presentation with, is that uh, it sounds like you're presenting these as, as sort of tools and options for folks to consider using, and how they actually incorporate them um, could be up to them. Is that a fair? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And and don't feel like you know you have to use the formula of start with user-centered story and then. Do this and this and this. Um, we don't. We're trying not to prescribe a formula, but maybe put a user-centered story somewhere in your your pitch. Yeah. The other thing that we've seen quite a bit with uh, with with pitches to get into ignite and even at the end uh, is that there are so many different types of of projects. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the examples that we end up using because they're the easiest to hold on to are product oriented. Uh, pitches where it's like I have a product that's going to easily solve this particular need, and sometimes you know that physical product is not actually what you guys are working on with Ignite. Um, if you're streamlining a process, for example, you really want to like modernize a particular um, internal system or internal process, uh, then you know the the story might be a little bit different, um, and. Uh, and then if you are actually delivering a service, you know, then it's still a product of a sense, but you're delivering some sort of service out to the people. You know, that has a little different flavor. So it's hard for us to actually speak in broad sweeping strokes. And um, we trust you all as like super smart adults to, uh, you know, to figure out like what's the best way to incorporate these. Uh, yeah. Uh, apparently, according to Andy Burton, uh, bluff bottom line up front is very common. So I'll Google that after this uh, to be sure that I'm caught up on everything. Uh, yeah, I okay. Would, so. I would just, just to add to that, I would just be very careful about um, like formulas in general. Um, and yeah, that that probably is the case. I mean, I bet um, if you, yeah, that might be the case that a lot of if you if you Google how to make a good pitch, there's going to be formulas out there. <laughs> Um, but try to stick to instead, you know, the work that you've done. Rely on those great um, interviews that you've done so far and think about how am I going to show off this, this information. Don't worry about following any sort of a formula. What is it only, like what percentage of startups get funded when they pitch? A tiny percentage. So that doesn't mean that the formulas always work. <laughs> it's more about, you know, the, the info, the content that you're, you're trying to portray. Yeah, so Jim posted a question, um, that, and I'm going to summarize a bit, Jim, that uh, 
he doesn't know, and nobody knows yet who they're exactly pitching to, at least within Ignite. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, but so let me provide a little bit of context so that you know the type of people that you're presenting to. But it, um, you probably won't actually know exactly who they are until you, until you get there. But um, uh, in case you're curious, so uh, like I'm a panelist, we're going to be um, uh, we're going to probably have about 10 people that are going to be rotating across these panels, and these are going to be folks from across the idea lab, uh, as well as across the department if they have been, uh, they run similar programs to uh, the Ignite Accelerator, or they have gone through Ignite multiple times and have been heavily involved. Um, so it, it, it's actually uh, probably important to highlight that the person, there's a really, really, really good chance uh, that the person that you're presenting to doesn't have a clue, like, what you do and what your office is and you know what what your uh, what your office acronym is um, so that practice explaining like you know we're five will be very important in the storytelling um, I, I typically find uh, that some sort of storytelling element of so I, so I understand sort of who your target audience is uh, ends up being really uh, really helpful uh, so Jim I hope that that helps you uh, Nicole has a question. Uh, any other tips on incorporating both user-centered and what we learned in story arc? Um, I don't know if you want to quickly go back to that one. Uh, I think you still have the power to share your screen there, Erica. Sure. Um, so let me show. Let me pull up. Reed, give me a moment. I'm gonna. There's another slide that I used to show. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. While you pull that up, I'll, I'll just sort of answer a couple that are on the on like the program side. Uh, Bob asked if Erica's slides are going to be made available, and the answer is yes. Uh, by the end of the date today, uh, I'll be posting those on the Ignite web page. Uh, let's see. Jim asked another question. I actually posted this earlier, uh, but I'll, I'll bring it up now. Um, we mentioned the idea of uh, that the types of solutions perhaps might be outside the box, and he's asking for a little bit more explanation. Um, but from a program perspective, this is sort of our thinking. Uh, typically, there are a lot more projects that we want to support than we actually have the capacity to support. And Unfortunately, there's quite a bit of a, of a manual touch uh, or human touch uh, involved in shaping projects once they're in the accelerator. Um, so, so the decision-making process and our internal deliberations when we are trying to figure out who to select, um, typically it's not like, oh, these people are really great and everybody else is, uh, is way off and not great. Sometimes uh, someone is presenting a solution um, that is, is, I guess, a little bit safer um, than another type of solution. And it may be the right thing. It may actually be what they should be doing and what they should be proposing. So we're not asking you to go out and uh, propose a crazy idea just for the sake of proposing a crazy idea. Um, but one element of the Ignite Accelerator is the concept of uh, of providing a little bit of a safe space for the testing of those riskier ideas. So um, you should be pursuing sort of the truth and the right solution for you. Uh, if you, uh, if you through your discovery, you know, are learning that your solution is um, is sort of, you know, it's it's hard for me to even describe what safe is because it's because um, uh, it's so relative to everything else that ends up coming in. Um, I, I perhaps, you know, perhaps another word that comes to mind is disruptive in nature. So some ideas um, and some solutions end up being very, very challenging to the status quo of the way things uh, are going. Uh, and thus they need like a little bit of more of the, the department's involvement to help uh, provide, I guess, that air cover for the testing out uh, and, and perhaps even implementation of this disruptive concept. So, uh, so Jim, I, I hope I, I'm getting to that. I, I feel like I'm bouncing around the answer just a little bit. Um, uh, you should be pursuing and, and thinking about what the best you know, solution is for your particular project. Um, uh, it just ends up that during our deliberations, one element that we do um, uh, 
I guess, incorporate is sort of how disruptive or um, uh, challenging um, or quote unquote sort of outside the box uh, a solution ends up being. So incorporate that. Uh, okay, Eric, I'm looking back at you. I didn't know if you were okay. wanting something up there. Yeah, let me. I was trying to find a more recent example, but let me just show this really old slide um, that I stopped showing because I felt again like I don't want to give the like a, a formula. But here's another example. Let me share my screen. Okay. Um, are you seeing story example outline three, the nested story? Okay, cool. So, um, so for example, you know, you could it could be a bunch of stories within a longer story. So you might start with, um, you know, here is where our team started, um, and do a couple of what we learned story arcs. Um, so, Erica, Erica, I'm just going to interrupt very quickly, just only because we see like your editor view, not the presentation view, if you're. Yeah, that's the only. Let's see. Let me try. Which is, which is fine if that's what you're doing. I just wanted to be sure you know. Ah, okay. Try that. Okay. Better. Um, so it could be the case that you have, you know, multiple. What we so you could literally start with, you know, here's here's the first key thing we learned. Here's one little mini what we learned story arc. Here's another key thing we learned. Here's another you know mini key story arc. Um, and and then like move into your user centered story arc of okay and this is and finally here's the last turning point so here's what we're here's who we're going after here's what we're um, here's the problem we're trying to solve etc. Um, so again this is not this is not a great slide this is not a great example but um, you can think about different ways to um, you know. You might start with the beginning of this project and take us through a couple of key turning points in your customer discovery process so far, and then in the end, you know, tell us, okay, what who you're really focusing on, et cetera. Or you could, I guess it's the bottom line up front style where it's like, no, you're going to present Kamala first, her problem, the solution, and then take us back to, okay, how you got there. Here are three turning points that we had. You know, along the way in our customer discovery process. Um, so I think those are both; those are two examples, right, of how you might incorporate both story arcs. If that's helpful. Uh, great, Nicole. Uh, hopefully that helps you out there.